and you can go ahead. Uh, hello, my name is Sophia and I am the CAFE lead for Science and Policy Exchange. Welcome everyone to Unlocking Science, the rise of open science in Canada, perspectives from early career researchers. Uh, we begin by acknowledging the lands on which we gather today. Uh, science and Policy Exchange, SPE, is based on, in uh, Yojage, uh, Montreal, the traditional and unceded territory of the Canadian Kehaka, Mohawk, a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst many First Nations including the Kanekehaka of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, also referred to as the Iroquois or Six Nations Confederacy, uh, Huron-Wendat, Abenaki, and Anishinaabe. I am broadcasting from Vancouver, by the way, situated on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. So to give a brief overview of this event, we will first have uh, two guest speakers, Dr. Masha Chema and Dylan Roskam's address, each speaker, We'll give several minutes of remarks and afterwards uh, presentations. Um, after the presentation, we will open up for uh, audience questions. And then finally, NSP volunteer moderator will help facilitate the breakout room sessions. And then we can re regroup to share everyone's thoughts and insights. So make sure to mention in the chat if you prefer English or French for these sessions, and we will sort you by your preferred language. So as our first speaker, we're honored we have Dr. Masha Chema. She is a policy advisor to, to, to Chief Science Advisor of Canada, Dr. Mona Niemer. In that capacity, she supports her on open science and science advice and emergencies. Masha earned her PhD in 2016 from the Department of Molecular Genetics at the University of Toronto. Her first foray into policy work was through a global health fellowship at the World Health Organization that took place during her PhD, PhD study. So, uh, she further honed her policy chops at the Mitex uh, Science Policy Fellowship, which many of you might be familiar with. So it's great to have you here with us today, Masha. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm joining you and I'm grateful to be on the unceded uh, Anishinaabe and Algonquin territory and um, really delighted uh, in the interest uh, in this topic. I also want to acknowledge that there are a lot of knowledgeable people that I see in the audience. Um, including Ellie from UNESCO and Jenny um, and from the library community as well. So thank you very much for joining and you're making, the introduction will be really uh, geared towards kind of uh, open science policy kind of one-on-one, -on -one. Uh, but I'm sure you can contribute uh, your perspectives with questions and, and in the chat. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen right now uh, because I presented, uh, I prepared a presentation for this. All right, is that uh, working? Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, uh, just an introduction. Uh, I'm going to paint a bigger picture of kind of open science on the international and domestic. Um, level and then Dylan will bring it to the institutional level and provide a couple of words of advice for early career researchers. Um, so what is open science? Um, you know, there's many dimensions to what open science is and the two most commonly mentioned is open access to publications and open data. Uh, but there's other dimensions to it as well, like open uh, notebooks, uh, open peer review, open so source software, social networks, citizen science, educational resources, et cetera. Uh, in the words uh, of my boss uh, and an open science champion, open science uh, really a lot is about uh, changing in culture. So open science is more than making scientific products available. It is the way of thinking about and doing science. It's about transparency, sharing, accelerating the pace of discovery. By embracing open science, Canada can lead the way to a more collaborative and productive future. And I want to thank MNI for making this slide because it was part of their uh, Open Science in Action Symposium, which is an annual go-to event uh, on open science. Um, so what are the benefits of open science? Um, I would say, that different groups of scientists come to open science from different angles. Uh, this is a more generic uh, approach, general slide. You know, um, putting things in the open will increase exposure uh, of your work, um, as well as, or which results in often higher citation rates for researcher when we talk about publications. 
uh, the practitioners can see your work. Uh, for example, as a policy advisor working in the government, I have very limited access to library subscription. Uh, we have some, uh, but not nearly as much as at a university library. And the same is true for people working in the granting agencies at FRQ, et cetera. Um, your research can influence policy, you know, to, <laughs> to indicate that point. Uh, the public can access the findings, um, taxpayers can get value for money and researchers in developing countries or to those working outside the traditional institutions uh, can see your work. Uh, one thing I want to highlight uh, is that different scientific disciplines have kind of different cultures and different adoption rate of open science. So this slide just demonstrates uh, kind of the level of open access publishing in different disciplines. Um, and uh, the main point here is that um, there's different cultures within research communities uh, and different disciplines. Um, and there's different maybe rationale also for the disciplines to engage in open science practices. Like Dylan will probably mention in neuro uh, research, uh, a lot of it depends on actually being accountable to the patients and trying to solve issues that are so big that one researcher can't solve versus for physics uh, researchers who work on CERN, the infrastructure that they're working on cannot be afforded by one group or even one country. You know, you need to kind of band together uh, to do that. Um, the same is true for space research. You know, so there's different angles to it. Uh, this is just a very quick overview of international landscape. Uh, I just wanted to mention that there is a Plan S, uh, which is uh, international initiatives where some funders starting with European funders have joined uh, and want to catalyze uh, the transition to open access, immediate open access. Uh, the big international milestone is the UNESCO recommendation in open science that was adopted unanimously uh, in 2021. And I see Ellie is with us in the audience. Uh, she's the lead on open science in the Canadian Commission for UNESCO and a very knowledgeable person. So maybe if some of the questions are around that, we can ask her to answer them. Uh, that would be great. Um, and I just wanted to highlight, um, you know, that for many philanthropic funders, you know, like uh, Wellcome and Gates Foundation and Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, they see open science as really a tool to increase the impact of their investment. So they want to see how can their investing, you know, their investments in research can have the bigger impact, the biggest impact it can have. And open science is often the answer. Uh, you'll see that these are often work on uh, health research where there's a clear kind of argument uh, uh, for open science and, and higher adoption rate, especially in light of COVID. Um, so there are many different international countries around the world that are moving forward on open science uh, at a high rate. I just didn't have time to mention them all, but want to uh, highlight some common elements that I see. Um, maybe others can add more, but uh, often there's an immediate open access to publications component, data management component, which is not necessarily open data, but you know it's a prerequisite, it's a foundation to it. Um, supportive infrastructure uh, for fair data and sometimes for publications as well. And then, um, there's also this element of how we evaluate research uh, performance and whether we should include only open access papers or the researchers' contributions um, in terms of the data or publications should be valued appropriately. So those are the four components that I often see. Um, in terms of the Canadian landscape, this is mostly focused on the federal landscape since that's the one I'm most familiar with, but I have one point there about Quebec uh, research funder FRQ. So um, in 2008, there was the original policy on open access uh, by the Canadian Institute for Health Research. Um, then the policy was adopted by the two other granting councils. And since 2015, we have a tri-agency open access policy that requires uh, publications funded by the, these grant, uh, granting agencies to be available within 12 months of the publication date. Uh, the compliance is um, not, it, it's not, um, it's measured right now, but it's not publicly available. It's the compliance is not complete. Uh, and so there's more work there. 
uh, in 2019, the Tri Agency as well as the Genome Canada signed up uh, for uh, DORA. Um, and this is specifically focused on research assessment and kind of highlighting the principle that um, there's more to research assessment than the number of publications. And recently, the Tri Agency also released the research data management policy, um, which is not really about open data, but about researchers, including the plans of how they're going to manage the data, manage and store their data in their grant application. And then relevant for the Quebec context, uh, in 2021, uh, the FRQ, Fonds de Recherche de Québec, has joined Coalition S and will require immediate open access to scientific publications starting in March 2023. So I work in the office of the chief science advisor. You saw her picture earlier with a quote uh, about open science and what she thinks about it. And for, uh, I, was, uh, I joined the office fairly early uh, in January, 2018. The position was established in September, end of September, 2017. So um, I was the, here from the start of the open science work and just maybe wanna briefly talk about uh, what our office has done uh, in the past four years. So it started in 2018 by the commitment, um, you know, to be a champion for open science. Part of the chief science advisor's mandate is to ensure that federal science is available to the public. So the scope was a lot on the federal science. So um, publications and research produced within government departments like Environment Canada, uh, Natural Resources Canada, and other departments. So in 2018, we have committed uh, to create a roadmap for open science uh, under the under the open my uh, sorry uh, under uh, we have um, Canada is part of open government uh, initiative so international initiative and so every two years there's a plan and so we added that commitment under the 2018-2020 plan uh, then we created. Uh, Open Science Advisory Committee to advise us uh, on this roadmap. It was chaired uh, by Leslie Weir, who is now the Chief Librarian of Canada. So again, highlighting the importance of libraries in this uh, in this work. Uh, in, in early 2020, just before the pandemic, we had a public release of the roadmap uh, by the Minister, at the time Minister of Science, Innovation, Economic Development and uh, the Chief Science Advisor of Canada. And since then, uh, we have worked on implementation. So part of that uh, were recommendations for the government departments to create open access, uh, open ac sorry, open access plans, open science plans, uh, and consult the scientists in their departments to do that and uh, do a number of other things. So this is underway. Uh, a lot of this open science plans are published. Uh, we have also worked uh, on the framework uh, for the federal scientists that's called framework uh, for implementing open by default that kind of articulates what should remain closed. Uh, it, it's important uh, that science is open and secure and there are some things that uh, we don't necessarily want to share, but as long as it's clearly outlined, everything else is open by default. Uh, and it, at the end of last year, uh, we have conducted open science dialogues uh, with Canadian researchers and funders um, around their views, kind of more in the extramural space um, from Canadian universities to hear uh, their thoughts uh, and how we should move forward. So all these documents are on our website and um, the title pages of the reports are here. Uh, as well as we worked on a pilot repository uh, for federal departments uh, to put their publications. And uh, this project is going ahead now. So uh, what can early career researchers do? Uh, I think that's the important question. We really need the support of early career researchers um, on the open science front. Uh, I want you to be aware of what it is and know how you can contribute to it. Uh, so then you can be part of the change, you know, the culture change and, uh, and other sorts of changes that we need here. So uh, first thing is just to continue learning about open science. Um, and then uh, talk to your colleague, talk to your um, supervisor, if you're still a graduate student or a postdoc about what can you do in your research. Um, librarians in your institution have a wealth of um, knowledge on the topic, as well as um, they're often champions of this. So uh, get to know your librarians and see how they can help. 
And then uh, if there is a committee at your institution on open science, join it. And if not, then you should form it <laughs> and uh, get together with like-minded people. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's really, really important. And then make your views known. Uh, I just want to highlight that uh, currently there's an open call for open science policies at the Journal of uh, Science Policy and Governance. This is really an opportunity for early career researchers to practice their skills uh, in writing papers. And if you feel like you are, uh, you don't have enough knowledge on this, um, very thoughtfully, uh, they have also provided a number of workshops that are recorded and available on their website so you can learn more about it. Um, so they will take you from different aspects of open science. Um, so you can, you know, on your own or with a like-minded colleague, uh, write a proposal, write a paper, and get it peer reviewed and out there. Um, so this is it for me. Um, thank you very much for your time and I look forward to the question. And now off to Dylan. Thank you, Masha. That was very insightful. And you really have brought up some interesting points for discussion later on. Um, for our next speaker, we have Dylan Roskamp Edris. As Open Science uh, Alliance Officer for the Tenenbaum Open Science Institute, TASI, Dylan interfaces with the national and global open science communities to promote and update uh, the uptake of open science tools and practices in Canadian neuroscience research. So uh, by developing relationships with, with researchers, research institutes, as well as national and international neuroscience initiatives, uh, Dylan supports the adoption of open science through knowledge translation, resource sharing, and administering TASI's open science support and partnership framework. So Dylan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sophia. Uh, hello, everybody. I do not have a presentation, so I will try to be as personally engaging as possible. I'm going to first talk a little bit about the neuro itself and why open science is important for it. Then I'm going to talk about TOSI, the Tenenbaum Open Science Institute. I'll talk about some of the interesting work that I've seen from open career researchers and finish off with a bit of a recommendation. All right, there are your signposts. So first, starting off with the neuro, what does it do and why is open science important? The Neuro, or you might know it as the Montreal Neurological Institute, is a teaching and research hospital. It was founded by Wilder Penfield back in 1906. You may not have heard of Penfield, but if you have, you likely did in the Canadian Heritage Moments. I might be dating myself here. They were these little one-minute snippets produced by the Canadian government to talk about great moments in Canadian history. That was back in the day. The short provide, and that's short, I want to start talking about it because it provides an excellent example of what the Neuro is all about. It starts by showing a woman who complains of smelling burnt toast and then having a seizure. It transitions into an operating theater where Penfield uses electrodes on that awake patient's brain, and this is something that happens and amazes me every single time I get to see it, to identify the part of the brain that produces that sensation of burnt toast and which is also causing the seizures. What that kind of procedure, what this little vignette represents is, a strike, is the striking therapeutic advance and an advance in our understanding of the brain. It simultaneously gave evidence for the theory that certain sensations are mapped to certain parts of the brain and enabled a sur surgical intervention to help patients. It's that interplay of the quest for new knowledge and new therapies that really underlies the philosophy of the neuro when it was founded as well as it does today. However, going on from that nice story, there are some differences from Penfield's time to now. And this is where open science enters in. The first major difference is that there have been relatively few really significant advances and breakthroughs in developing therapies for neurological disorders in the last decade. Um, we had L-DOPA in the 1950s. And since then, you know, we've heard every single year a new failed trial to develop a cure or at least a decent treatment for Alzheimer's disease. Even deep brain stimulation, which is super neat and one of the most significant advances in the treatment of movement disorders that we've seen in the last decades, it doesn't cure the underlying disease and has diminishing effectiveness over time. Second difference, unlike removing a relatively large chunk of the brain to deal with epilepsy, many neurological disorders, whether we're talking about ALS, we're talking about multiple sclerosis, we're talking about Parkinson's disease, they're much more complex in their causes and mechanisms and can't be dealt with so easily. It's in that context, it's simply more and more unlikely 
that any single individual or even any single research group or even any single institute will produce the discoveries needed to lead to cures for the growing number of people suffering from neurological disorders. So what's needed is a is the collaboration of large networks, whether intentional collaborations or informal collaborations, of people, labs, institutes, patients, partners, industry, and that's facilitated by the sharing of the open sharing of data, open sharing of research software, sharing of methodologies and protocols, papers, and all of the other, other wonderful inputs and outputs of research. I mean, that's what open science is all about. And it's for these reasons that in 2016, the Neuro decided to adopt a set of open science principles under which it aims to share all of its research outputs as openly as possible. Now, as Masha indicated, it's not just tossing everything onto the internet because there are patients involved here. So there has to be an open science by design element. You have to make sure that you're sharing as openly as possible, but in a way that respects the dignity and the privacy rights of the patients and research participants that are involved. Another interesting area that the neuros had to figure out is relationships with industry, because there is some conflict between restrictions around intellectual property and open sharing of research in such a way that can be accessed and used with a minimum of barriers. I'm happy to answer questions about either of those, but let's just move on for now. Going on to TOSI. TOSI, the Tenenbaum Open Science Institute, was also founded in 2016, made possible by a donation from the Larry and Judy Tenenbaum Foundation. It's got two missions. Mission one, promote open science within the neuro. Mission two, encourage open, the uptake of open science at research institutes across Canada. My role primarily concentrates on that second mission. I reach out to folks at other research institutes in Canada, from trainees to institutional leadership, to try to help them and their institutes design a set of open science practices and principles that works for them, that's tailored to their unique research context, depending on the fields that they're concentrating on, their particular capacities, the infrastructure that they have access to. Now, I've gone through the neuro and I've gone through TOSI, and because this talk is supposed to be mainly about open science and early career researchers, I wanna spend some of the rest of my time talking about some of the neat work I've seen early career researchers do, both within the neuro and outside of it with relation to open science. There are lots of examples, but I'm just gonna concentrate on a couple that I think are particularly interesting. First, within the neuro, there's this new initiative that's come up called the Open Science Office Hours. One of the biggest barriers to the adoption of open science practices is simply a lack of education. People don't know what open science is, what platforms you can use, the best ways to use those platforms, or how to encourage or how to incorporate open science into your work. Um, the open science office hours led by a PhD student, Kendra Odick in the lab of Dr. J.B. Pauline is trying to deal with this by creating a kind of peer-to-peer -peer education and mentorship system. Um, it's in essence, a group of trainees with expertise in different areas of open science. Those trainees provide training sessions, but also have office hours where people who want help with doing preprints, with sharing data, with making sure that you have accessible and shareable code and code that's well documented and all of this other plethora or honeycomb or buffet, as I'll say later, of open science activities, um, how they can engage most effectively in all of those. These kinds of initiatives are important for two reasons. First, of course, because it helps spread knowledge, helps deal with that education gap. But I think perhaps more importantly, it helps create a community. It helps create a culture. There's no better way of promoting a practice than to see that your peers are engaging in it and to engage with them about the successes and the barriers that they encounter while doing so. It's that kind of give and take and observing of what other people who are like you are doing that helps to create culture and create community. Another initiative I wanna talk about is the Neuro, Neurolingo Initiative. It's a science communication initiative led by members of, the, of McGill's Integrated Program in Neuroscience. They basically help trainees and other early career researchers to communicate their science to the public and help produce TED style talks and then share them on YouTube. This might not seem like what we think of when we generally talk about open science, concentrating as we normally do on open data and open access publications. But when we think about open science, for me at least, it always begs the question, open for whom? If we think about sharing research as only something that concerns other researchers, 
Um, then maybe SciComm to the public doesn't really fit. But at TOSI, at the Neuro, and in my opinion in particular, we want to take a little bit more of an inclusive approach than that. Science isn't just about researchers. The Universal Declaration on Human Rights identifies a universal right to science, but how do we actualize that universal right to science? If we want science to have an impact, and more importantly, perhaps, want it to be trusted by the public, we're seeing a massive crisis of trust in science at the moment, it needs to be not just open science, but wide open science. It needs to be something that is effectively communicated and engaging with the public. Okay, so those are a couple of examples within the neuro. I wanna talk about a few that I've seen outside the neuro that I also think are particularly cool. Um, one is the data binge effort at the Malafagian Center for Brain Health. Um, it's led by Jeffrey Ledoux. It's basically a collective problem solving program where you have mainly early career researchers and some PIs coming together to collectively solve problems that researchers are actively encountering right now in their research. They work together primarily through the use of open platforms. So open science framework, GitHub, this allows them to not only bring a whole bunch of expertise from different areas together to bear on a particular problem, but um, also since it's all done in the open, other people can benefit from the fruits of that collective problem solving. It also helps create community. Um, and by solving problems in a way that's open allows other people to benefit who you may not have ever predicted would need to benefit from those problems. It's a way of creating abundance, of sharing the love, if you will. Data binge fits into a constellation of other similar activities. So you think about hackathons, you can look up Brain Hack Montreal for an example of that, or book dashes. You can check out the Turing Ways book dashes, or just check out the Turing Way itself. It's a super cool community operating in the UK. Um, that's where we see people, and most of them are early career researchers, coming together to solve existing problems in the open and in real time. Another thing, the last outside of the neuro initiative that I want to highlight is the Douglas Research Center's Trainee Open Science Awards. So it's another great example of dealing with one of the bigger problems in science and making sure open science becomes the norm. That's, we talked about education, but this has to do with incentives. These are all about giving small awards to trainees with cool ideas in open science to give them the resources to pursue those ideas in open science. And they just finished their first round. In this first round, they funded a trainee who's working to create a module for the open, uh, the Canadian Open Neuroscience Platform to share experiments. So there's a difference there between sharing data and sharing the experiments, the digital representations of the experiments that produced those data. If we're gonna have open science, we need to share all of these outputs, whether it's to ensure knowledge equity or to ensure reproducibility and replicability or all of the various other reasons people engage in open science activities. Like I said, these kinds of initiatives deal with another huge barrier to open science. It's not just lack of education, it's a lack of incentives. Unfortunately, the academic research system still rewards things based on the technology of like literal paper journals that got sent out to people. So we still primarily pay attention to journal publications in high impact factor forums. Um, we can have a greater discussion about that, but what these kinds of awards do is give trainees the resources to pursue non-paper generating initiatives and have a new line to put on their CV, which is also factoring into the existing incentive research or the incentive structure within science. Okay, last little section here. I'm sorry if I'm talking very quickly, but I can talk for this, if I talk for days about this kind of thing. Um, I wanna talk about a couple of recommendations for early career researchers when they wanna practice open science. When I talk about open science, the metaphor I like to use, and this is not mine, um, but one that I picked up and I'm reusing, uh, is the open science buffet. There are all sorts of dishes at the open science buffet. There's the pre-pint salad, the roast data sharing, the braised code sharing, maybe a little protocol sharing stew, and science communication comfy. It's unlikely that everyone is going to be able to or even want to or have the resources to try every single one of these dishes. 
What I can encourage you to do is to go up to the Open Science Buffet, observe the dishes that are there, and try out a couple that work for you. Maybe a small plate of pre-printing with a little GitHub-based code sharing on the side, or a small portion of data sharing to go along with your normal fare of writing and publishing papers. So I know you aren't going to be able to do all of the admirable open science practices immediately for a whole constellation of different reasons. What you can do is try the ones that seem most accessible and appetizing to you. And this is important. Talk to your peers about it. Get advice, tell them about how you did it, what worked, what didn't, because sharing about not just what worked and bragging about how well you did, but also sharing what didn't, what barriers you encountered are both equally important. It's like sharing positive and negative results for the health of science. Ultimately, this is all about changing culture towards open science. And culture, boiling it all the way down, is nothing more than the non-genetic and non-molecular information that we carry forward from one generation to the next. It's our collective story. And in that story, you early career researchers play a key role. You're the carriers of that culture, the carriers of that knowledge. The only way that we can make open science the norm is for you to take it in, hold it, and then share it with others. Hopefully, if enough people do that, then in the future, we won't need to talk about open science because it will have just become science done right. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Dylan. Thank you for that enthusiastic presentation and, of course, your advice. Um, you really covered uh, topics uh, in neuroscience and open science across Canada, so that was very insightful as well. Um, we will now have a Q&A period with our speakers, so if you have any questions, you're welcome to use the raise hand feature or go ahead and share your questions on the chat. Um, Let's see, we will wait a few minutes. Uh, I think we have one. Okay, we have our first question from Chantal Arif uh, for Dr. Chima, um, for Masha. In an article featured in the Logic uh, February 3rd, 2022, titled Beds Open Science Plans, uh, held up by budget concerns. Um, uh, let me continue reading. Um, technical problem. Well, by budget concerns, technical problems, it stated that paying for first rate open access has been identified as a major problem by a federal department. And uh, many also have uh, failed to meet self imposed deadlines in their departmental OS action plans, so creating repository and green access options. So um, they're asking to elaborate on the progress from the department um, made to date. So. Well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for joining the seminar, Chantal. Great to see you again, virtually. Um, Chantal was a librarian at um, a National Research Council and now is with the University of Ottawa. Uh, first of all, I just wanna highlight that um, there was an article about you know, uh, whether departments were able to meet their commitment to open access goals uh, laid out in the Roadmap for Open Science that I mentioned in my presentation, which I think is fantastic. You know, we want more coverage in the news about open science and people being interested and reading about it. So maybe after you guys um, submit your papers for that um, journal for science policy and governance, you can also engage local science journalists or write yourself different stories about open science and maybe different initiatives that Dylan has outlined and what it means for everyday Canadians. You know, uh, I think it's very important to be engaged uh, with the media and and uh, usually open science has been kind of at the back, kind of people didn't really even know what it means or cared. So I think that's, it was a great win actually that we were contacted by the journalists and uh, highly recommended for our boss, chief science advisor to, to give an interview and to engage on this. So the question is really about, so the Roadmap for Open Science outlined very ambitious goal uh, of immediate open access publishing by January, uh, 2022 um, for peer-reviewed publications. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, the roadmap was published in February 2020, so right before the pandemic started. So just to let you know that this goal was not achieved, you know. 
Um, but there is progress. And uh, what our office is doing right now uh, is working with uh, Shared Services Canada, which is IT provider for um, Government of Canada departments and, uh, and science-based departments and agencies. Uh, they piloted uh, an open software uh, called DSpace that the libraries used you know, for repositories and are very likely moving ahead. It's just in the finalizing stages right now to have this repository available for government departments who don't have currently uh, a repository. So they could use the green open access route. I'm sorry, we didn't cover it in our presentations, but it's basically self-archiving uh, to achieve open science uh, and, oh, sorry, open access goal. Uh, now, whether departments, there will be further guidance around what can be shared. Um, and, you know, there's the embargo question, but the crown retains copyright. So even there's a little bit of more technical conversations around there about what, um, what can be shared and when, but we think it's an important step uh, towards enabling, uh, you know, this goal. Uh, you can make all the goals, but you actually need enabling infrastructure to achieve it uh, or funds. So the other thing I just want to highlight is like, like are the departments accountable for their open science uh, action plans? So there's no, the accountability really is, um, is in the open science steering committee, which is a committee uh, of uh, consisting of uh, chief science advisor of Canada, but also the head of the library and archives, the head, uh, you know, um, head of the shared services Canada and head of the treasury board secretariat that meet once a year and review the progress. Um, and then talk to departments to see what the barriers are and how they can help enable it. So there is accountability mechanisms um, and we're looking into how to integrate um, achieving these goals towards different evaluation frameworks, but it's a soft accountability, I would say right now. The important thing is that there is a momentum and a desire to do things and things are moving and the conversations are happening both at the working level, but also at the top uh, bureaucracy level as well. Thank you for this question that's quite specific, uh, but it gave me an opportunity to demonstrate that you know, things are happening within government and this is uh, how it's set up, but also just highlight the importance of engaging with the media and having this on the radar of everyday Canadian. Thank you, Chantal. Thank you, Masha. Um, and I was just wondering uh, if Dylan has a different perspective on this from the academic side, maybe. I don't necessarily have a different perspective to bring, but one thing I want to highlight in Masha's answer that I actually think is very wise is a lot of people feel like there should be, you know, mandates. You have to be open. You have to be doing this. You have to be sharing everything. And whether or not there should be, ultimately without reliable infrastructure and support to be able to allow those people to follow those mandates, it's not really very fair to have a mandate about having to do X and having to do Y imposed from the top down. If you look at the kind of hierarchical needs of culture change, making it possible needs to be prior to making it required. Because if you make it required before you make it possible, you're not going to lead to a positive impact. You're not going to lead to a positive attitude towards your mandates. Um, it's just very important to try and solve or give people the tools to solve that infrastructure and capacity piece before saying this is what you have to do or else we're going to come through with a stick or not give you a carrot. Yeah, and making it easy to, you know, totally. it's like me going to the gym. Like I want to go to the gym, you know, I'm motivated, but like I don't do it unless you know, there's one really close to my house and I make sure I put my running shoes like by my bed or something. 100% and it's like easy to get into and it's a welcoming environment and all of those types of things. That's why I really liked, uh, Dylan, what you said about peers and mm -hmm. highlighting the role of peers. Uh, it's, it's huge, um, you know, knowing that you're not alone and having that community to support you. Um, it's, I think, really important. And thank you for highlighting these initiatives. I also see open science as a buffet. You don't have to do everything, mm -hmm. but there might be something that will appeal to you and that will also work uh, for your discipline and for the reason why you do science, why you want to make it open. There can be very different motivations. Absolutely. Right. 
And thank you for um, denoting that community aspect and also for using that metaphor um, with food and open science. So we have a question here from um, Lali Mahmoudian. Um, she wants to know if there's something specific in open science considered for nutrition by the government. I didn't understand the question, to be honest. I mean, I don't know if Dylan, you did, but maybe you can elaborate of what you mean. Um, let me see. Well, uh, from the other forums that we have been doing here at ST, I think she's uh, um, wondering if uh, there are any nutrition initiatives that are taking place uh, with the government that implement open science? Um, I don't know, frameworks, models? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, my I'm working fairly horizontally uh, on open science, um, so I'm not familiar with, with all specific, like discipline or specific initiatives, uh, especially on nutrition. Okay, all right. Uh, I guess that's fine. Maybe we can uh, discuss, for example, uh, the impact of open science on various academic fields. I, I realize that it might be different with uh, social sciences and humanities than the technological and uh, scientific disciplines. Um, do you have any comments on the application of open science there uh, or in programs from the government? Well, while Mash is thinking about this, yeah, I don't, um, I don't I, see this question in the chat. Uh, is that somewhere else? Because I couldn't hear it. Could you paste it in the chat? Oh, uh, maybe we can skip it for now. And I think there's another question from Christopher Wall. Um, so there, he's talking about a way to achieve open science for uh, all the public and recent events with COVID um, and the spread of misinformation. So how can we tackle misinformation or the correct interpretation of, of the ways that the general public views it uh, without when it's not scientifically related? So open science and misinformation. I misinformation is a really big issue. And I almost hear um, I heard this term called, called infodemic, like the pandemic of like the information. <laughs> Uh, it's a huge issue, uh, and how you tackle it, uh, I don't have the answers. Um, I mean, in a way, you think that making science open and process pro open would increase trust, uh, but there's more to it. Like, it's not just about the vast amounts of information being openly available that would change people's mind. I think there's a more nuanced um, approach to it. I'm interested what Dylan uh, have to say about this. I would break my answer into two general categories. So there are small like instrumental things particular platforms can do. If you see, you know, BioArchive, great preprint service, changed its policy during the pandemic to make sure that at the top of every preprint, it says, this is not a peer reviewed article. Um, just to make it very clear that, you know, this is not something that is accepted as part of the peer reviewed scientific literature. There are all sorts of little things that any given platform can do in order to communicate to people um, that, you know, this has not gone through certain quality testing or that this is something that is open and that you should take with a grain or a large heap of salt. Um, I, on the other side, though, I think that, like, if we're thinking about this a little bit more high level and philosophically, the culture and approach that academic institutions have taken have been defined by the channels of information distribution that existed, for example, prior to the internet. So there was communication between peer researchers horizontally, and then there was communication between researchers and like students, the people who could attend their lecture halls or read something like that. What we're seeing now is that the avenues for information dissemination have just obviously exploded and have a billion different forms, whether it's in tweets or blogs or preprints or whatever. Um, in which case we need to think about how we need to adjust our philosophical perspective on the role of academia. Is it just about disseminating knowledge between peer researchers and between researchers and students or because of the new technological capacities, do we have an obligation for every researcher to engage in science communication? I don't know, I'm not saying that that's the answer or for every university to have a really well-funded SciComm department to be able to say like, yes, this came out, this is what it means, this is official, this is how it's been used in policy. 
we need to grapple with the fact that when information gets out, people will use it how they will. And there's no, there's no non-political way of dealing with this. There's no neutral way of being able to say like, okay, this is good information, this is bad information. But if we just stay hands off and say, we're not willing to get involved in that, we see an infodemic, which obviously nobody wants. Yeah, it's a really big issue, and I'm sure there are experts uh, on, in this field. It might be interesting to have a whole workshop devoted to misinformation and dealing with it. I mean, there have sometimes been kind of proposals of having every paper having a lay abstract, you know, so it's like clear what it means. Uh, but I think there's just some people who are by nature really skeptical uh, of whatever is coming from a traditional institution like this and think there isn't necessarily some you know, private interest behind it or something. Uh, and it would, it's really hard to change these minds and sometimes engaging more and trying to prove your point actually puts people in a more polarized position, um, kind of making them dig their heels. Um, so I think a part of it is clearly just about being sensitive, not just being like, I'm right because I'm a scientist type of thing, but also hear the concerns that people have. But um, there's definitely more to it, I wish. I wish I knew the answer. I also just want to quickly point out that like misuse of scientific information isn't new. It's not something that came about with the rise of open science. There have been people who have been misusing genetics research to forward racist ideologies for a long time. People who have been, you know, using either genetic or sociological research to forward sexist and misogynist views for a really long time. Perhaps the difference is just the volume of information that's coming out um, and the siloed nature of online interactions. And if, neuro, if uh, open science wants to take seriously this idea of breaking down silos, we can't just concentrate on our scientific silos. We have to concentrate on the silos that people are building for themselves within you know, Facebook, Google searches, Twitter, all of the above. That's great. Thank you for your in-depth answers. Um, I want to see if there are any more questions. We have um, one minute, maybe. So just in case, um, does anybody want to comment? OK. OK. Otherwise, um, thank you for your answers. And we can take up these questions on nutrition and other topics in the discussions uh, for the, the breakout rooms. Um, now, in the meantime, I would like to thank both our speakers for sharing their time and experience with us, our, our, uh, the Kathy coordinator, Sonja Su, for guiding and organizing the event, the many volunteers who made this happen, and to all of you for dropping by. We hope uh, everyone continues to stay with us for the break room uh, discussions, including our, our own speakers. So uh, without further ado, uh, we will now uh, move on to the breakout rooms and discuss the questions provided at the end of the policy brief. So thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you, Sophia. <laughs> See you soon. <laughs>